Hello friends and welcome to the Cold War Prepper. This is Lee and uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the, the full circle that we've had <clears throat> in history. Some of you may know, uh, but most of you probably don't know, that what got me into prepping was a little incident in 1962 called the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and uh, <clears throat> the Soviet Union was placing uh, intermediate range and short range ballistic missiles in Cuba and so we basically blockaded Cuba and told the Soviets to get them out <clears throat> or else. And uh, the, the Soviets were willing to go to nuclear war to ensure that they had these nuclear capable missiles in Cuba. And <clears throat> so, you know, we, we brought that to fruition, but that was probably the closest we've been to war um, <clears throat> since 1945, other than, you know, the uh, now, closest we've been to nuclear war, let's put it that way, until recently. Um, so anyhow, so it was, it was during this hysteria that uh, my next door neighbor was the block civil defense warden and he was building a cinder block fallout shelter in the backyard. So at the ripe old age of 10, I became extremely interested in fallout shelters and nuclear radiation and and uh, you know what you needed to put inside a fallout shelter in order to survive and all this kinds of stuff and that began my journey into the prepping realities so last night i did a live and and there was a very valid question that was asked and the question was if our country really cared for us why don't we have fallout shelters well one of the good things about being an old fart is uh, at the ripe old age of 70, and our country is now 247 years old. So in three years, we'll celebrate our 250th anniversary. That means that I've lived through 28% of this country's history, uh, a little bit more than a quarter, a little bit less than a third, but I've lived through a significant amount of the history of the United States, enough to where I can see uh, cycles repeating. And so, you know, the... Uh, the, the old stuff we had back when I was a kid, uh, the drills in school of going out into the hallway and putting your head between your knees and your hands over your head. And we used to say, and you'd kiss your bottom goodbye. But, uh, you know, I, I want to kind of go over where we were versus the transitions and where we are now. And you're going to find some interesting things in this. So anyhow, um, actually, civil defense started back in World War I, and then it really codified itself in World War II under what was called the OCD, or Office of Civil De uh, Defense. Uh, when it was finally made into a, an official Department of Defense um, office, the first head of the Office of Civil Defense was Mayor LaGuardia of New York City, and this was in 1941. So we had the, the Office of Civil Defense and also underneath the Office of Civil Defense, we had two other very interesting things. We had, and this is still active, the Civil Air Patrol. Then the other one was we had the Ground Observer Corps. So that was a whole bunch of people who were trained to identify foreign aircraft. And uh, they would stand watch on the beaches of the US and, and report in if there was an actual attack against the United States uh, by foreign aircraft. Um, so that stayed pretty much the same until, uh, 1954 uh, and, uh, in 1954, um, they came out with, uh, Operation Alert and, uh, <clears throat> so with Operation Alert, that was an exercise that they started doing in New York City where, uh, they would actually evacuate people to, uh, shelters and they would practice being bombed in New York City. And that lasted until 1961. The reason it only lasted for uh, about um, seven years, 54 to 61, uh, was because there was a lot of protest against wasting our time. This was citizen protests, wasting our time practicing going to shelters when, they're real, when there is no observable threat. We're losing too much money by missing work and Mothers with children were too upset that it was disturbing the lives of the children to do this exercise once a year, uh, for one day a year. So in 1961, that was the last time that they had uh, this practice operation alert in New York City. We had been <coughs> identifying, building, and stocking um, 
fallout shelters in the United States since Eisenhower. So Eisenhower did two things. Number one, he started the interstate uh, road system, which was designed uh, not for your convenience to get from one town to the next, but actually for military convenience to get to one town to the next. And so what he needed was a, a way to get uh, troops from one coast to the other coast and from north to south and di various points throughout the country. That's why it's mostly funded by the federal government because it's a military highway system. Uh, whereas the U.S. highway system, for example, when I grew up in El Paso, Highway 54, <clears throat> the U Texas was responsible for Highway 54 in Texas. New Mexico was responsible for the maintenance of Highway 54 in New Mexico. And then it crossed once again up through Dalhart, New Mexico, into a little bitty Guyman, Oklahoma. And then about a 30-mile stretch of Oklahoma and then into Kansas. And then across Missouri and on up into, into uh, Illinois. So Highway 54 went from El Paso to Chicago. And uh, you could tell when you changed states because of the quality of the pavement would change. And gosh, we were so happy of our roads here in Texas back then. But anyhow, uh, so that, that was the two things that President Eisenhower did, was establishing the bomb shelters or fallout shelters and the inter interstate highway system. In 1957, uh, President Eisenhower also started... Uh, well, what happened was the city of Portland in 1956 developed a, a uh, evacuation and notification system. They figured that they were probably going to be one of uh, the targets if there was a nuclear attack. Because <clears throat> remember, at this time, uh, in the 50s and 60s, ICBMs weren't that big a threat yet. We anticipated that all the major delivery systems uh, for nuclear bombs were going to come by aircraft. <clears throat> so the whole thing is, is basically a, a, a cross-polar um, attack on, on the city of Portland with bombers and nuclear bombs. And um, so the city of Portland came up with their own system. Then they turned that into a movie in, in collaboration with the Civil Defense, Office of Civil Defense, and uh, CBS made a movie about Portland in uh, 1954, and it was called, uh, I'm sorry, 1957, it was called The Day Called X. I'll have a, a link to that video down below. <clears throat> so there's one thing, there's a, there's a picture or a sign that says N-A-W-A-S, and that's November Alpha Whiskey Alpha Sierra. What that stands for is the National Air Raid Warning Alert System. They also... Uh, not right there, but right afterwards, they talk about uh, BMD, uh, Bravo Mike Delta, and that's Ballistic Missile Defense. And that's going to become important as we get further into this. Um, so then in 1960, um, let me see here, make sure I got my notes right here. <clears throat> in 1960, Channel 7 in Austin, Texas, right here in Austin, Texas, uh, came out with a movie called Target Austin, and it was another one. And this was written and narrated by Cactus Pryor. His son, Don Pryor, is still an announcer for KLBJ, Radio 590, here in Austin, Texas. So multi-generational, but Cactus Pryor is a, is a um, stalwart here in the, in the greater Austin area. He's a, he's a big-time hero. The other thing that's interesting about this movie is I watched it, and remember that this is made in 19... Um, 1957, yeah, 1957, uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, 1960, is they, they show uh, Matt Martinez, and Matt Martinez had a restaurant at that time called El Rancho, a uh, Mexican restaurant. That still exists. It's still the number one Me Mexican restaurant in 2023 in South Austin. I think it's on South Lamar, but now it's called Matt's El Rancho instead of... Uh, <clears throat> instead of the uh, El Rancho Mexican restaurant. In 1961, President Kennedy began an extremely aggressive uh, building of and stocking of air raid shelters and, and, and fallout shelters. And this would be, become part of um, the salvation we had in 1963, or 62, uh, November, December of 62, when we had the Cuban Missile Crisis was, you know, we were pretty much through that process. We were into that process of developing all these air raid shelters, all these fallout shelters. <clears throat> and I'm going to put a link down below on, on what you would typically find inside a federal fallout shelter. 
So here's the problem that we began seeing in the 60s, with, uh, right during the Kennedy administration and immediately thereafter, was up until that time, we had a very high urban uh, concentration. So people lived actually in the metropolitan areas. <clears throat> and then the suburbs became very, very popular. So as people started moving out to the suburbs, you didn't have this plethora of uh, multi-storied buildings that were ideal with underground space for fallout shelters and everything else. So then the question became one of, if I live downtown, you're preferring me because there's a, a fallout shelter fairly close to me, but if I live out in suburbia, I don't matter because there are no fallout shelters out in suburbia. There, you know, there's no undergrounds or no big buildings or anything else. So there was this dichotomy between the way that the urban people felt safe, whereas the suburban and rural people did not feel safe. So that started a little bit of a chasm. Uh, between the two, the, 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 the uh, city people and those who were suburban or otherwise. <clears throat> and then, uh, but back in 1954, we also established what was called the Conrad system. Uh, and so the Conrad was control, C-O-N, of, of electronic, E-L, uh, radiation, R-A-D, Conrad. <clears throat> and uh, so the Conrad system in case of an emergency, and you'll see this in the, uh, I'll put the link down below, in the 1960 movie for uh, Target Austin, they'll talk about switching over to the Conrad system, and that's where they tell you, in the event of an emergency, turn your radio, AM radio, to 640 or, or 1240. <clears throat> so that they, they refer to it as kilocycles in the movie, 640 kilocycles or 1240 kilocycles. <clears throat> and... Uh, you know, you'll receive further instructions there. That still exists today. But in 1963, uh, we replaced the name Conrad with the Emergency Broadcast System. So that portion of it still remains, the EBS. And the Civil Air Patrol still remains the same. But once we had, in the, in the early mid-60s, we started getting more and more submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and we started getting more and more intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles, you know, then the warning times. So you'll notice that in the one um, where we're talking about a day called X, when we're talking about Portland, the, the radars are giving them two and a half to three hours advance notice of the bombers coming over. They have plenty of time to get into bomb shelters, fallout shelters, and everything else. Then when we get to uh, Target Austin, we're talking about ICBMs, and the ICBMs could basically, from time of detection until time of imp impact, could be anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes. So we've greatly reduced the amount of response time that we have to get into a shelter. Now, with submarine-launched uh, ballistic missiles sitting in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Atlantic, in the Pacific, and then combine that with the ICBMs that they have and their bombers, uh, we have as little as seven minutes advance warning, warning and as much as 20 uh, from a submarine-launched ballistic missile. So the chance of somebody leaving their office or leaving their home and getting into one of these mega uh, shelters uh, for fallout is slim to none. Okay, They're just it, it just is not going to happen because of the amount of or the lack of time that we have to get to where we need to do. So that's why there was a strong urging back in the mid-60s for people to build their own underground um, fallout shelters. And uh, so then the funding for that kind of starting to wane. And in 1970, uh, you know, the, the realization, of course, we were in the middle of Vietnam and a lot of money was going towards Vietnam. We, were, we still had part of the Cold War going. Cuban Missile Crisis had been over for eight years. We had the space race going on. Um, you know, in the seven, in the uh, late '60s, early '70s, uh, we've we've just landed on the moon. Where we've got the end, basically, of the Apollo program. We're moving over into the space shuttle program. So a lot of money going into that. And people said, you know what? Building these uh, fallout shelters that we aren't going to be able to use because we're only in downtown of a city for eight hours a day. The other 16 hours, I'm in suburbia and you don't have anything for me out there. So the citizens said, no, we don't want that funded. You know, do away with it. You know, let's put the money somewhere else. So there's a bigger emphasis in the 70s on BMD, ballistic missile defense. So can we basically uh, 
destroy the, the incoming ICBM before it even gets over our country through an anti-missile missile. And so rather than building a whole bunch more shelters, we figured let's invest our money in destroying the incoming ICBM before it becomes a threat or it can, can uh, detonate over one of our towns. Um, so in 1980, uh, so, so in, anyhow, Nick, President Nixon, uh, and I'll, there's another film down here, 1970, and it's called um, In Time of Emergency. So this is President Nixon using the, the Office of Civil Defense, trying to get people ginned up to support putting more money back into our shelter system. And uh, so, you know, the shelter system's going down, ballistic missile defense is coming up, and that's kind of an intersection. So 1970 was the crossing point, and President Nixon was really pushing hard for us to restore and renew our, our shelter system, and it just did not work. Uh, then in 1983, President Reagan tried to, tried to renew all this, and, and, and it renewed emphasis on protection and, and safety as far as uh, nuclear fallout, as far as uh, nuclear annihilation. And so he invested $10 billion into what he called the Crisis Relocation Program. Well, there was a big congressional study, and it said, you know what, given the fact that we only have eight minutes warning, eight to 20 minutes warning, even with a crisis relocation program, the roads are going to clog, and we're going to lose 25 million additional people because this isn't such a good idea given the new uh, methods of delivery that, the, that our opponents have and, uh, and the lack of warning time. So the, the whole concept of um, fallout shelters as a government entity, that is one where they have identified the structural confines, how much protection is afforded through the masonry or whatever, or the depth of the building, stocking it with uh, hygiene products, uh, survival crackers, water, uh, the basic necessities, Geiger counters and everything else, uh, that went away uh, in about 1985. So we really have not invested that much money uh, at all into any kind of shelters other than for the privileged elite. So, you know, you, st you still have Cheyenne Mountain, you still have, you know, portions of Camp David, we have uh, the Biltmore and, and other things where we found out that there are all kinds of uh, shelters that have been built for the, the elite, our political uh, leaders, if that's what we want to call them. And uh, so we just don't, uh, don't do it anymore. Going back a little bit, 1951, we also had a program called Alert America, and that's where I got the famous duck and cover. That was a turtle, you know, and it said duck and cover. And uh, uh, then we had a couple other big programs, the Survival Under Nuclear Attack Program. We had Our Cities Must Fight Program. And then we had Grandma's Pantry Program. So Grand Grandma's Pantry Program is kind of what we need to be doing now uh, as far as establishing a pantry and all that kinds of stuff. Um, so what happened was in the Office of Civil Defense became the Office of Emergency Management or the Emergency Management System. And then Emergency Management System in 1969, uh, 1979 was put under FEMA, the Federal uh, Emergency Management Agency. And then as a result of, of course, 9-11, uh, 2001 and 2003, we created the Department of Homeland Security and uh, FEMA was put under it. So um, the reason why we don't have fallout shelters built for uh, our citizens anymore is, number one, our citizens don't want, we didn't want them. Uh, they didn't want to fund them. Uh, number two, because there is not enough response time for us to get into a shelter. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe if you're away from the blast zone and everything else and 30 miles downwind or something, but that's going to be in rural and urban America. But building a shelter there didn't make any sense because you had a very large shelter. Where you'd have to have people driving a large distance to get to it. So, you know, you want to have your shelters in high uh, population areas where pe more people can access it more quickly uh, than, say, in a rural area. So that's kind of where we are and uh, give you a little bit of understanding of uh, where we have gone through the um, whole process of building 
shelters back in the 60s. And like I said, in 1962, my next door neighbor was building that cinder block shelter in his backyard. I can remember the hand crank. That's what we used to generate electricity. It generated 12 volts of electricity. So we had uh, 12 volt lights, had a, um, the, the, it operated the fan that sucked the air in through the HEPA filter into the shelter. Uh, there was a bucket for a potty in one corner. Uh, there were shelves built into the wall that you're going to sleep on or sit on. And I mean, it was very, very austere. Um, and then, you know, the other wall had shelves of food and I mean, it was not going to be anything pleasant at all. And, but you know, it was, it was kind of glamorous to a, to a young 10 year old. So that's what kind of got me into this. So, uh, I just hope that gives you an idea of where we are, where we've been. And hopefully it answers the question of, if our country really cared for us, why haven't they provided us with more fallout shelters? So remember, we're all in this together so we can come out the other side together. Please be kind, polite, and respectful to each other. And remember that togetherness is the key. Take care. Bye-bye.